Take your Bibles if you have them to 2nd, 2nd Chronicles chapter number 34. And if you don't, just listen carefully. 2nd Chronicles chapter number 34. We've been going over this series on Sunday night, and uh, I was thought about you know changing it for this service, and the Lord said, Well, I already told you what to preach. Okay. Uh, so we're just going to continue with this series, and, and it actually works out well because last week's message, I finished everything except for the last point. So all you're going to get today is the last point of last week's message. But in order for you to understand it, I got to go back and do all of you know, I'll just give you a quick review over last week, and uh, then you. We talked about. Listen, when we're talking about developing ourselves, our children. Our families developing, and the whole idea is making a godly man. Making a godly man. This concept is very important that's kind of illustrated in St. Chronicles 34. It says this, it says in verse number 1, it says, Josiah was 8 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem 1 and 30 years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. Think of this illustration, okay? Uh, in chapter 33, his grandfather Manasseh, who began ruling when he was 12 years old, did that which was evil in the sight of God. Okay? These youngsters, these children were able to make choices over the kingdoms that they ruled. Okay? Now, I rule my children's life, and to be honest, in some extent, I rule much of my own life or my society and uh, what people, how they view me. Much of my life is ruled for me by others just dictate my activity. But even a child, you cannot rule the kingdom of their heart. You cannot conquer the kingdom of their mind. So you ever tried to invade your child's mind? Okay. We can guess. I was, I was preaching somewhere on this. Wouldn't it be cool if they made an app for the iPhone? That you could hold it up to your kid? And Siri would say, your child is thinking. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> what are you thinking? I'm not going to tell. Hold on. <laughs> tell me what my kid's thinking. Your child is thinking they wish you wouldn't do that. <laughs> but there is there is no such app. Okay? There is no such thing that allows us to rule. Now, friend, I rule parts of my children's life. I rule the exterior of their life. And we all know this as adults. You're never going to get out from under the rule of somebody. Right. 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 Somebody's yeah. always ruling part of you. But you are always in control of the kingdom of your heart and your mind. And what the man of God does, he is not conquered, he surrenders. Amen. Right. Yeah. He surrenders. Manasseh ruled his kingdom, he ruled it wickedly until the last two years of his reign. Josiah, when he was eight years old, he began the course of obedience. Obedience, willful obedience, produces desire. You know one of the reasons sometimes that we don't have a heart for God? We struggle with willful obedience. Now, our kids and even ourselves, sometimes we're forced to be obedient, right? Doing 65 and a 40, see the cop car, I'm going to slow down. Was that willful? No. That was based upon known consequences. Right? Some of you know better than others. Right? That was based upon known consequences. Even if I continue at that speed, it's very likely I'm going to be punished, and that punishment is going to begin to demand my obedience. I get the ticket for $275, right? <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to everybody in the service. <laughs> I get that. You, know you know what that ticket's going to do to me? You ever drive up 301? Yeah. 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 When you drive up 301, you go through Waldo? 
You go to the You know what you do? You do the speed limit, don't you? Right. Even some of you heathens that don't do the speed limit, you do the speed limit. But known consequences forces obedience. But that's not what Josiah was doing. Josiah was providing willing obedience. One of the reasons that we can't produce either, either ourselves or our children into being godly individuals is because we spend so much time being forced into obedience that there's no willful obedience. Willful obedience produces desire for God. If I willfully obey the Word of God, guess what it produces? A desire to know Him more. That's what it did in Josiah's life. He's eight years old. I'm going straight, not going to the left or to the right. When he was 16, while he was yet young, he began to seek God. That's the step beyond obedience. Mm -hmm. Just beyond compliance is now a desire to know his God. And as he got to know his God, guess what happened? God began to change his life. Okay? Some of us are stuck on willful obedience. God said, I fight. <coughs> How come I can't have a great relationship with God? Stop fighting. Stop fighting just a simple obedience. God says do it, I have to obey, and if I do it, it produces in me a desire to know Him more. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. What's the first step? Obedience. Okay? But obedience doesn't conquer the heart. Obedience just sets me in an environment where I am now in a place where I can begin to desire my God. So Josiah had obedience first. That produces desire. After he began seeking his God, it produced change. Please be patient. He began seeking God when he was 16. Major changes happened to the kingdom when he was 20. Be patient. Keep seeking God. Be patient with others. Ask them to... Ask them to seek God. The greatest change in your life is Holy Spirit change. That's the greatest change. When the Holy Spirit leads you and directs you and changes your life. Yeah, but I, I want my, my wife to change. I want my husband to change. I want my kids to change. Well, give them some clear guidelines of obedience, particular depending on who it is. Ask them to walk in those guidelines and then promote their desire for God. And then the Holy Spirit will begin to do a change. Then there's the next concept. He began, look at it, it says in verse number 18. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house. And so he had done this process where he has begun desiring God and God produces change in his life, in his kingdom. Then he begins investing in the house of God. He begins investing in his worship for God. If you walk in will for obedience... It produces desire for God. When you seek God, that produces change. And when change comes into your life, you can't help but want to bring back worship to your God. And that's the process whereby we find ourselves being not just compliant to the religious order, but being moved by a personal God. And he begins investing. You can read it. We don't have time to... To read it, but you can read it. They had they had workers go in there and they paid money. The house and the house of God had been left in disrepair. And guess what happened when they started investing in the house of God? They started to get a return on their investment. Right. They started pouring into the house of God, and guess what they found? They found a book. Right? It's what it tells us in verse number fourteen. When they brought out the money that was brought into the house. Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law that the Lord had given by Moses. I, I understand the concept here, but think in, the, think in the reality of the kingdom of heart and mind. Nobody can conquer. You are king of it. Willful obedience with your mind and heart. Desire to know your God. Change being produced. Now I'm going to worship and invest back in my God. And then there's a return and the word of God comes back to me. The message comes back to me. And they begin reading the book to Josiah. Look what it says. I'll read it to you in verse number 19. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. He was moved by the knowledge of God's word. He was moved by it. 
Can I tell you, sometimes as Christians, it's a very dangerous place when the Bible has just become old hat. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Old hat. Why is that? Well, probably because I'm stuck in the beginning process, probably somewhere with willful obedience or lack of desire for God personally. He was moved. Can you ask yourself, when was the, the last time you were moved by the word, the reading of the word of God? He rent his clothes. He put his face in ash and cried. He said, man, this is after he purged the kingdom. This is after he taken down all the high places. This is after that he had done more than any other king up to that point, really, other than Hezekiah. He had done a marvelous work, and now his heart is vexed by the knowledge of how far he is yet still from God. And he's moved by it. Now God responds. Look what it says. I'll read it to you in verse number 27. When the message, he, he said, is this true? And they said, yep, it's true. You, you violated the law. You've gone against the word of God. And as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so that you say unto him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitations thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. You say, yeah, but that was a wicked kingdom that he was king of. Have you heard what the Bible says about your heart? <laughs> right? Have you heard what the Bible says about your heart? Desperately wicked. Who can know it? And we are confronted with that. We go, yeah, but I'm trying. You know, I'm better than that guy. You know what, Josiah could have done? Yeah, but give me a break. Look at all I've done. Look at look at how I have I have I followed thee and I've I've changed and uh, what? Come on, there should be there should be something, but it wasn't arrogance at his achievements. It was humility before his God. Truly a man of God, truly a lady of God will respond to the word of God with humility. One of the most common question that I ever got as a youth pastor was, why can't we do that? Why can't we do that? Can I interpret it? I don't want to respond to God. I just want to know what I can get away with. Yeah, right. Hmm. You know what that's an indication of? They've not surrendered their kingdom. They got walls up. They've not surrendered their heart and mind. And you're getting evidence of that from the outside. You know what I've found that often I feel as an adult? Well, why can't I do that? I find myself oftentimes not surrendering my kingdom. And one of the greatest indications is when you're confronted with God's Word, you make excuses. You don't weep. We don't cry. We don't say, Dear God, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Lord, I need You every single hour. My heart is desperately wicked. You know, we say, hey, we're the Christians. We're the good guys. It's that wicked, wicked world out there that's the bad guys. Listen, he wasn't dealing with the uh, Philistines. He wasn't dealing with the Amalekites. He wasn't dealing with all those other ites. You know who he's dealing with? The children of God. Their kingdom was messed up. And this good king was now being able to give, give, be given insight that others had not been given because he had taken the process to become a man of God. And guess what God brought to his kingdom? Peace. He brought peace. Hey, we know ultimately it was temporary because other kings were coming. Right? Yes. I promise you, if kings after him would have responded, as he had responded, the peace would have been extended. But he brought him peace because he humbled himself before his God in response to what the God's, God's word said about the violation of his kingdom. See, when I serve God and when I give God my heart and when I begin to change my life, Really what I'm doing is I'm setting myself in the, finally the place where God can begin truly to reveal to me how I can become more like His Son. 
A preacher, I'm a good Christian. I go to church, I do good things, and, and I, I don't do all that bad stuff everybody else talks about. So I should be good. No, no, you're finally in the place where God can truly reveal the condition of your kingdom. As the psalm said, Who is man that thou art mindful of him? We forget, and the psalmist says, we forget that our frame is but dust. And finally, Josiah is in a place where he's responding to God's word and he gets peace. Man, isn't that what God desires for us in the New Testament? Yes. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. The book of Hebrews talking about labor that you enter, therefore, into that rest. That's how the Christian is supposed to live. How come we struggle with that? Can I tell you? We don't follow the process. Begin with the humility of a child and say, neither to the right hand nor to the left. I'm just going to serve God. He tells me to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey Him without question. And that willful obedience, that cheerful giving, that desire to please Him, will produce desire in your heart to know Him more. And when you get to know Him more, guess what He's going to do? He's going to want to change your life. A lot of times that's where we stop. Okay, God, I like knowing you and all, but don't try to change my life. Don't try to change my kingdom. And I'm talking less about the exterior and much more about the interior. Much of us, our exterior is already conformed by the weights of society, right? I'm a pastor, therefore much of what I do is conformed already. It has nothing to do with the kingdom of my heart and the kingdom of my mind. I have to surrender that to him. And guess what he wants to do? He wants to change it. And finally, once he changes it and gets some of that stuff out of there, finally I'm in the position to be ready to actually hear God's word. And then he says, plus you violate it. You say, what, what a depressing message. It seems like God's just going to continue telling me where I've done wrong and how I can do better. Okay. <laughs> right? Hmm. Trust me, friend, he, he, he still blesses you. He still responds to your obedience. But even the process of your obedience, are you perfect? No. And because you were obedient yesterday, is he not going to respond to your disobedience tomorrow? Even an earthly father wouldn't do that. One of my kids violate the law. And I say, you know what, I'm not going to get on to you. You were obedient last week. <laughs> And that what we do as parents, we spend the whole time helping to correct our kids so that they can become better. And so finally they graduate. Well, guess when we graduate? When we get to heaven. But it is a peaceful journey if we have made it to the place where God's Word can actually have an impact on our heart. And God says, listen, you're not perfect. But you're at a place where I can impact you. And guess what I'm going to bring to your kingdom? Peace. Amen. Would you like peace of heart? Would you like peace of mind? Yes. The peace that passes all understanding? Well, where is it going to come from? It starts with willful obedience. I will obey my, my God. It produces desire. I will seek after my God. Then it produces change. I will comply with my God. Oh man, then it produces peace as you respond to the Word of God. That's an amazing place. I was reading over this and I'll be honest with you, I thought to myself, why do I not have this response to God's Word sometimes? And the first thing that flashed, flashed in my mind was, ah, you know, I'm doing too bad. You know, maybe you're just not convicted by anything. Things are pretty good. <laughs> no, sure. Sure. I, that's failing to humble yourself before God. Failing to recognize the true condition of your kingdom. Josiah had done great stuff. Great stuff. And the response, the knowledge of God's law was you violated. Man, I, I can serve God with all my heart, but guess what tomorrow brings? Another day where I have to again surrender my kingdom. Again surrender my kingdom. So my question is, where are you at? Are you at a place where you are responding to
to God's Word and God's Word is having such an impact on your heart that it's overwhelming you with the knowledge of what His Word says about your heart and mind. And you are responding saying, what do we do? Inquiring of the Lord. Listen, you come to church or you read, your, you read the Bible and you're like, man, that's good, amen, amen. And it never pushes you to require back to the Lord. Well, therefore, what shall I do? You're not really responding to God's Word. One of the reasons, and praise the Lord, when we get our building, we'll have an altar in the front. Amen. Uh, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> One of the reasons that we have preaching was so people will respond and come back and surrender their heart and say, I inquire of the Lord. Therefore, what shall I do? Ah, preacher, I got it. I know what to do. Mm, you're missing it. What shall I do? When's the last time you responded to God's Word as Josiah did? What shall I do? Verse 21, Go inquire the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured upon, upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. Man, what shall I do? And when you respond, guess what? God is always ready to draw my back to you. Always ready to draw. I am so overwhelmed by the condition of religiosity that us Bible believers find ourselves in. It's just a matter of habit of what we do. The question is, hmm, we don't really realize the wayward condition of our kingdom. We're telling our kids, surrender your heart, surrender your heart. Mom, Dad, when's the last time you surrendered your heart? Gave it over to them. Well, I give my heart over to God every day. No, no. When you do, He's going to come back with this response. And you'll be overwhelmed. <laughs> at the condition of how far you are from where He wants you to be. And you will cry out to your God. Therefore, what shall I do? And when you allow Him to work, it produces peace. And what a beautiful thing to have peace. So where are we at in this process of becoming a godly man? You're going to just have to keep, keep continuing. As soon as you fall out of obedience, you're way back at the beginning. There's no reason that you as a Josiah can't become a Manasseh tomorrow. You can become a Manasseh tomorrow. As a preacher, most of my life has been given my kingdom. I've ruled it. I've been a Manasseh. And you know what happened to him in Manasseh's reign? He repented. Sure. In his last two years, sure. he was a Josiah. And the ability that we have to surrender ourselves to our God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd help us today. Lord, oh, the need that we have for walking in obedience. Lord, for surrendering the kingdom of our heart and mind. Lord, we do not desire to be obedient just so we can comply with some man-made religion. Lord, we desire to live within the guidelines You give us so that we have an atmosphere where You will allow us to come before You and seek You and desire You and know You so that You can produce more change. So You can even narrow the parameters where which we live. And as those parameters are narrowed, they become more narrow the closer we get to You. And Lord, may we desire to be consumed with the desire to, to know Your presence, for You to be preeminent, for You to be in charge, so that we can live that life of peace. Lord, I pray that You'd help us. In Jesus' name.